Hey everyone, Ponyo here. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of After Dinner Mints. I highly encourage everyone watching to join us in the Art Blocks Discord. A link to our Discord can be found in the description of this video. As always, make sure you like, comment, and subscribe to our YouTube channel so you don't miss an episode of our weekly show. And now let's introduce our guest for this afternoon. We have generative artist Kelly Milligan. Hey, Ponyo, how are you? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Kelly? Yeah, good. Thanks, man. Great. Well, I appreciate you being on After Dinner Mints. Um, you know, you dropped this project on Artblocks Curated just a couple of weeks ago called Active Emotion, which we'll talk about in just a moment. But, you know, to kick things off, why don't you tell us a little bit about your background? Yeah, cool. Um, so I, I mostly come from a, a web background, front-end web development, um, and then that kind of moved more into creative web development, which is much more focused on sort of like animation and, um, and interactions and things like that. Um, I, I kind of originally, uh, you know, uh, moved from, from New Zealand over to Europe and spent about five years kind of working on more creative projects over there, working at a place called Resin in Amsterdam. They do really awesome creative work. And that was really where I was exposed to sort of Canvas and WebGL and those more creative tools uh, on the web and in the browser. Um, and during that time, through travel and through, you know, the journey over there and things like that, I really got exposed to a lot of more traditional art through uh, visiting, you know, places in New York and um, going to MoMA, going to the Met, seeing these sort of old masterpieces and, and things and these ridiculous collections of, you know, just masterpieces forever. Um, and, and that was quite inspiring, you know, just like a lot more exposure to art than I guess I had um, when I was living down here in New Zealand. I mean, New Zealand actually has a really great um, art scene for the most part, especially for, you know, for our size. But um, yeah, it was really like once I was over in Europe, I really started engaging more intensely with, uh, with art. Yeah. Great. great. And then how did you get into, you know, generative art? Like you'd sound like you did some traveling, which kind of inspired you early on. But I'm curious to know, like how, you know, how did you get into generative art? Yeah, it's an interesting one. Eh? I was, you know, I was working with these tools every day. Um, so making stuff with Canvas, animations and stuff. Um, and I'd started following quite a few people on Twitter who were kind of also in this highly creative web space. Um, some of them have even gone on to release stuff at Artblocks, people like Matt and William and stuff. Um, and, you know, it was kind of like quite a cool little subculture of, of really highly creative um, programmers and developers and coders and stuff on Twitter. Obviously there's people that had been doing this stuff for, for many years already. People like Robert Hodgen, right. Who's been doing amazing stuff, even like, you know, 10 plus years ago, uh, maybe not on the web, but you know, with other tools. Um, so it was like that kind of really creative code driven community. Um, yeah. And that, that kind of like the idea of taking those, those tools we're working with to make, you know, websites and web projects and then actually going out to create, art with those was really um, compelling to me. And then even even more so if I could then kind of blow that up to like some sort of print resolution and actually print it and put it on the wall. Um, that was kind of like a, a light bulb moment. It was like, oh, you know, we could do that in the browser. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, so I actually started making like a little tool which allowed me to kind of create graphics in the browser uh, and actually export them out at like a really high res. It was kind of like a really rudimentary version of, of some of these tools we've got now, like Canvas Sketch and things like that. Um, but that was quite fun because then I could just kind of like tweak paper sizes, export out a file, send it off to the printer. Um, and that was, that was that kind of flow of like creating graphics, just exploring graphics for graphics sake too, you know, like purely visual output, not worrying about a brief or, you know, writing unit tests and stuff like that. Um, just purely visual satisfaction and then being able to like have a, a tangible, you know, print in my hands afterwards. That was, it was super cool. So. Yeah, the first couple of experiences I had with that just really lit the fire and I've been kind of working on generative ever since. And that was back in sort of 2016. Very cool. And then you also yeah. mentioned, you know, Matt uh, and then also Robert. And I'm curious to know, obviously you started, you, you mentioned that you followed them on, on Twitter. Were they the people that you followed and you kind of learned about art blocks through them or how did that come about? Yeah. Yeah. Um... So I guess like art blocks, yeah, I'd, I'd been following Golod for a while and I saw him launch Archetype and I thought that was really cool. Um, 
and then Matt did subscapes. Um, this is kind of, I guess this was all back during that sort of big wave of 2021. Um, and I guess like not, not very many of the people in that sort of community I'd, I'd been following on Twitter were doing stuff on Earth at that point. It was more sort of like people had just started dabbling with, you know, Tezos and, and on hand and stuff like that. Um, so to see like a few of these bigger Earth based projects come out was quite interesting. It was kind of like, oh, okay, yeah, there's something here. It's like, you know, before that, I was kind of like, oh man, the fees are so high. And <laughs> um, like the, just the values of these things, is, it seems crazy, you know, um, compared to where we were coming from, where like you could put stuff up on a print shop and you might, you know, sell $300 worth of prints in, in a year or something, right? And then all of a sudden, like, there are these these tokens that are worth like thousands of dollars. It's just, it was, it was a weird time. Um, but also, you know, incredible and amazing. And, and I could see these people that have been following, like actually have this, Sort of life-changing um, opportunity through cryptocurrency and, and NFT art and stuff. It was pretty pretty awesome. You know, a big uh, a big shift, I guess, in the way things had, had been done previously. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you know, can we see some of those early generative art pieces that you created? I think you mentioned. Yeah, for sure. Um, is it since 2016? Is that when you kind of started? Yeah, yeah so that's when I first kind of started playing around. It was sort of like late 2016, yeah. Um, and I've got kind of a list of old stuff here I can run through. So part of the um, the initial exploration was this sort of random walker sort of thing. So just taking, you know, a grid of, of space and then actually just walking like a, um, a randomized point through it and then a few different colors. So if we zoom in on this, you see it's just like dots. Um, and so this was one of the kind of initial explorations I did, which was really just, it was kind of like a, like a work in progress to figure out the tool that I was building, right? So like how I could, you know, render this, then export it out for print, stuff like that. Um, but I actually quite enjoyed, I quite liked this. So it was kind of like, oh, sweet. Okay, that's cool. Let's see what else I can make. And then uh, I jumped in and, and kind of, sort of like at the same time, I was like, oh, this is fun. I'm going to see if I can, you know, create some art for like family members and things like that for Christmas that year. I was like, okay, let's <laughs> So we can do so this one's like a like a fragment shader based one um and you can see like at the bottom here there's like a little footer so i even built this into the tool so i could kind of like um just save out different iterations and it would kind of auto increment like the the render number at the bottom here essentially like applying this all of this like <laughs> this post-processing stuff for me pretty random um so here's like another one this is this is also kind of i even call this one hello world because it's just it was literally me just like getting a, a fragment shader working in this environment so like um super simple from like a creative development perspective but somehow when you see that like printed on paper it's like oh man the fact this is made with code is actually really interesting um despite how you know simple technically it might be um this is another one that uh we made for my sister-in-law so we we're just trying to think of like you know when it comes to christmas you know like trying to think of gifts for people and we all already have too much stuff you know but if you can make something that's quite a lot more soulful you know so um created this little series randomly. I can't remember if we, um, it was my wife and I were kind of like chatting about what we should make for her. And we were like, I think we might've even consulted my brother, who's, who's uh, her husband and kind of asked, you know, what colors do you, does he think could work and blah, blah, blah. And then we kind of like came up with this system, um, which essentially just like randomizes triangles in this grid. And they're all kind of center based. Uh, using some blending modes and stuff like that. I got like a, an image of a mountain in the background there. Um, it's funny to look back at your old work. Eh? And then actually this system is kind of what evolved into this one, which is one of my first kind of more serious, I guess, um, series, which I've even got on my website and stuff like this. So in this case, I kind of took those triangles and, and kind of extended them out to be more like um, pseudo isometric pyramids, I guess you could say. Um, so it's not actually 3D, but it's more kind of the effect of it. And then, you know, just stacking those and also applying like a top and a bottom access to it and um, then really leaning into the blend modes. And you kind of get these really interesting, almost like reflective um, effects. And um, I was just I was just quite taken by these. I thought that was really cool. So I've had a few of these printed, as you might see on the wall behind me up there. Yeah, I was going to ask you about those pieces. Are those <laughs> all, are those all kind of like earlier pieces? Uh, kind of. So I mean, so that one there is like, it's kind of one of these structures ones, which is just like a a really early work. So it's like a nice, just grounding way to think back to my roots. And then over here, I've got kind of more of my 
like my personal brand, which you might have seen on, on like Twitter and stuff. So that's mm-hmm. it's actually like a real time system where the letters all kind of move around and interact. And um, I use that as like a, a signature system now. So I actually, whenever I create a piece of artwork and I, I distribute it, I always sign it with like a, a unique iteration of that. So I can kind of run it and it spits out a bunch of different, you know, unique signatures using the same glyphs. That's cool. That's very um, and then cool. the one running on the screen up there is is kind of like another um, series which kind of uses physics, but it's in a very rudimentary state at the moment. But hopefully, at some point, I'll I'll dig back into that a bit more. Awesome. Um, then I had a couple of others. This one here um, is another kind of early work where I kind of I was just playing around with you know sine and cosine and figuring out how i could kind of create like a spiral uh in 2d but have it kind of give it like a 3d effect so um, then i threw some noise in there and i was like oh damn that looks cool um almost like ink or you know something like that and then i started extending sort of in in the blending space and stuff and i started getting this more sort of like transparent glass-like effect which i thought was really cool um i mean i've ended uh ended up creating a series of these um that I've got one of these on the wall downstairs too. I tend to have quite a lot of my art on the walls because I just find like yeah, <laughs> that satisfaction of, of printing it and framing it and <laughs> chucking it up. We're running out of wall space though. So like, you know, because <laughs> as I've collected more and more art from other artists over the last couple of years, it's, we're ending up with like frames sitting up against the wall, just looking for somewhere to go. Um, but it's, it's just like, this was a really cool case study for me because it really highlighted how you know, really simple process can yield quite complex results. So this is really just, you know, running a whole lot of circles along this path, um, varying the radius and using like a really low opacity. So you get like this kind of, just the sweeping um, transparent sort of effect. And then you even get the benefit of, you know, as it passes over itself on the corners, you almost get that like the thickness of, of like a glass tube where you can actually see through, you know, see through the transparent material and it, it amplifies the thickness. Um, and then I just run like another path over the top, which is like just on the top path to give it that reflection on the top. And so it's like, you know, such a such a simple technical approach can actually yield, you know, something so interesting. And even these little bits that look almost like, you know, molten glass or something up here when it kind of <laughs> stretches out. Yeah. And I was just like, damn, that's, that's awesome. And that's just, you know, getting to grips with the power of noise and stuff too, and how you can use that to make really organic looking and feeling effects. Mm-hmm. Um, and then another one which I've ended up, you know, leaning into quite hard is this really deeply nested noise stuff. So this is one of my first sort of, uh, you know, investigations of that. Um, this is definitely like a path well traveled. You know, I think IQ, who's like a really well known uh, like graphics developer, he worked at Pixar and stuff. He does all these amazing articles about like how to do stuff with shaders and, and cool things like that. He, he has this great article about um, domain warping and using FBM, fractal Brownian motion. Um, and kind of nesting it to get these really complex and, and organic sort of textures. So I kind of took that concept and then kind of like nested it further and further and further and just saw how deep I could go. And I started getting these really um, pretty awesome outputs from it that just felt super unique and super, super organic, super like, you know, the planet, uh, you know, the surface of planets or, um, you know, minerals or all sorts of cool things like that. It kind of almost feels macro and micro, like you're zoomed in really far through a microscope or you're also zoomed out really far from like a satellite or something. So there's like a really interesting thing there. And um, seeing these on the wall is really fun because, you know, as you go and investigate up close, you see all sorts of different little details and things. This is probably the first really big print that we got done. So we got this done at A0, which was also kind of like a test to how far I can push that, that tool of mine. Um, canvases tend to like max out at about 16k on either axis in the browser um, and that lends itself pretty well to sort of that a0 size uh, but that's kind of been a bit of a that was a bit of a limiting factor until i i took on uh terroir earlier in the year and, and late last year um so i've done a few iterations of this now I've kind of got this rust series i've got yeah. one called terraform which is uh it's actually on the wall here behind me let's see if i can turn my webcam around quickly there it uh, is. Yeah, that's a really cool one. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah, such yeah. a beautiful series. Then, um, yeah, thanks, man. Yeah, I mean, I was I was really taken by these. It's like, again, with the, you know, the simple concept, but then just the the, the potential of it is really, um, really stunning. Actually, enough, I've still got this up here somewhere. So I've got Terroir here. I'll just talk about this now, too. So this is kind of the third iteration. I released this earlier in the year. And this is probably my final exploration of, of this stuff now, like, 
these systems are, are really amazing because they can produce such a wide range of results, mm -hmm. but they're also really hard to control, right? So it's like so much of the time on this project was spent just trying to rein it in and, and bring it within a range where like all the outputs are satisfying because otherwise like it's just so chaotic that it can be really difficult to kind of to have something in mind and actually achieve that because it's just it's so broad you know how far it can move um so this is kind of taking that original concept from the ones i just showed you and then kind of really pushing it further in terms of color usage um all sorts of different effects i've got you know different domain warping things in here to kind of do the discs or whatever and then um as a part of this i also figured out how to export them much larger so i, I figured out how i can export these all the way up to sort of like 30 by 50,000 pixels, which is, you know, several meters. Um, and the way it does that is it, it kind of renders out these chunks and then reassembles them as one giant PNG. So they come out at like three and a half gigabytes or something, but, wow. um, <laughs> you know, the detail is amazing. Actually, I'll see if I can quickly pull one out. Uh, let me just quickly find one because it's just, it's, it's lots of fun to share. Do you sell prints of any of yeah, these, like the, these, these older pieces or are they kind of just like your own personal collection? Yeah, well, the older ones, um, I did put quite a few of them up on on Hen back in the day. Mm -hmm. um, and those are kind of out there as these really limited, like, five to ten piece <laughs> object cool. um, things that I've minted. But those are kind of, I have them in a folder now called Techniques, uh, sorry, Antiques, Techniques, Antiques, because they're just kind of like the, you know, the um, the, the beginnings, but uh, yeah, not necessarily yeah. the, you know, let me pull this up. Here we go. So I got this one at 50 by 70. If you zoom all the way in, um, it's yeah. it's got like loads and loads of detail, uh, which is really mm -hmm. fun to look at in print too, because it's just super dense, super detailed. Um, you can really do, you can see the noise a lot more when you look in this close, but at the same time, you've got certain things like these ripples here, which feel really organic. Um, so this has been you know super fun to explore. Yeah. But as I said, I yeah, that... I think it's probably time to put this one to bed for a little while, just because it's <laughs> I'm kind of craving a bit more control for a change, you know, where it's like I can actually move things more, you know, intentionally in the direction that I want them to go. Yeah, I would love to see some of those pieces on like a side of a building or like you said, just like as big as humanly possible because yeah, the, just the detail, yeah. on some of those. it'd be really cool to just walk up to and then kind of see all these little, I don't know, little parts and pieces yeah, absolutely. that just look beautiful. Very cool. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting, it's like, Oh, so just one last point on that. It's like, I think yeah, at this yeah. point with, with rendering it out of that size, it's almost more like the operating system is becoming the barrier. So, well, like Photoshop, you know, you're trying to open a file, which is 50,000 pixels by 50,000. And like, it just starts running out of memory or just things just start working the way you expect. So it's, I guess it's like those other tools in the ecosystem of how we create, you know, big graphics files are actually starting to fail me now compared to the, the, the art that I'm exporting from the browser, which is pretty wild. Like I never really expected you know, that to be the case. <laughs> yeah. That's where we're at. So. Awesome. Mm. Well, I appreciate you sharing those earlier pieces. It's it's always just really cool to kind of see an artist's early work and then how it stacks up to, you know, how they've built up their career. So I appreciate that. Um, but yeah, I would love to kind of jump into your project drop, which released on Artblocks Curated. It's called Active Emotion. Um, and, and so on the, I believe on the website, you mentioned the idea, this is like an, the idea of exploring the act of painting. Uh, do you mind like elaborating on that just alongside <laughs> with the, the inspiration behind this project? Yeah, for sure. Um, so the project kind of started out as like a, an investigation of like how I can create this really interesting, evocative, you know, paint texture. So I've always been a massive fan of abstract art. Um, a lot of the people that have, that have kind of inspired, you know, my artistic practice are some of those sort of older um, suprematist or abstract expressionist artists. So the ones that are really, really like strong in the abstraction, you know, there's really no impressionism at all. It's like, here's a, a simple shape or here's, you know, a, a, a brush stroke or, you know, it's, it's kind of mark making rather than sort of trying to actually paint a subject. And I find that really powerful because it's 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 really up to the to the audience as to how they interpret you know what what the artist's been thinking and feeling and and what they're trying to say through their work. Um, and I, I find like with that sort of art, things can just kind of click. You know, like you look at something, and you're like, yeah, I love that. That's that's really interesting. Um, and I think there's something kind of more there than just liking the subject matter. It's actually there's something some kind of quite primal about the visual appearance of that that's really capturing your attention. Um, 
And so on that abstract expressionist side of things, you know, that's really a practice which kind of was all about expressing the, the sort of the trauma and the depression of, of like post-war USA. And, you know, <laughs> um, it's a lot of like raw emotion put into like these brush strokes and these, these kind of marks made with, with very much that like emotional connection. Um, and it's really abstracted to the point of just being, it's more about the act of painting itself than, and, and sort of how the artist is translating their, their thoughts and feelings on the canvas versus, you know, yeah, trying to paint like a specific subject. Um, and so with, with this, I, I really wanted to kind of try and extend that Abex kind of theme into this digital space. And, and as I was doing that, um, you know, a lot of these thoughts around sort of what is this, this act of painting really, you know, how does it translate in this digital context versus that physical context? Um, you know, what is paint? Does it need to be this wet media that, you know, you get out of a tube and you apply it to a canvas? Is that the only form of paint that's really, you know, artistically sound? Or can we actually simulate paint a little bit and actually have that, that analogous sort of act of painting in a digital space as well? Um, so all these sorts of thoughts. And then that led on to other things too about like, you know, if it's the machine that's painting it, is it still actually expressing any sort of emotion? Um, Am I expressing emotion through the machine by allowing it to paint for me? You know, these, I feel like there's a lot of concepts here that, that's, that sparked all sorts of thought as I was working on it. And I really hope that um, as people are viewing it, they're kind of thinking about these things too. Uh, so yeah, the work is very much kind of inspired by like the, the really evocative texture of like pigments and paint and wet media and brush strokes and how that all kind of, how that can say so much, you know, just for like an abstract stroke of paint on a canvas. Can, can say a whole lot um, because of how expressive the actual material is itself. Um, and so by yeah, digging into like trying to get the texture and the color and the, the material looking, you know, somewhat close to real life, um, that kind of allowed me to try and push a bit further into this, this evocative and expressive painting in a digital space, yeah. That's great. And I wanna unpack just a little bit about that texture that you've kind of created on this, you know, digital canvas, you know, what's the process mm -hmm. for generating that specific texture that you've built in this project? Yeah, cool. So if we think about just what I was talking about before with Terwa, this, this kind of really deeply nested noise, um, all the learnings that I kind of had building out these systems over the last several years really kind of gave me the, the tools I needed to try and create this more expressive sort of paint as well. So I'd had this thought quite a while, like, okay, so if I wanted to simulate, you know, oil paint in the way that pigments and stuff will blend together, how would I do that? And I was really stuck on it, trying to think of, you know, a way to do it. But then as I got kind of deeper and deeper into TOR, I was like, oh, dang, I think this could be a really nice way of achieving that because of how organic, you know, these textures can be even in still form. What if I then took like a, a smaller, you know, palette of this and then tried to kind of like run that across the canvas to essentially create like a brush stroke of that of that palette. So I can actually show you here um, how that works. So yeah, if you if you, uh, if you hit the uh, tilde key on your on your on your keyboard, you can actually see this in all the live tokens. So oh wow, this is the little swatch at the bottom, which is the paint. And so this is essentially like one of those little you know deeply nested noise studies uh, with all sorts of different you know possibilities as far as color and texture go. And then the paintbrush, which is kind of what's what's moving across the page here. I'll see if I can find a better example. Yeah, this is probably a better example. You can see here, there's kind of this rectangle, which is kind of dragging across the page. And this is all happening in a fragment shader. Um, so that's taking that palette and then kind of applying it over time and over space to give it that, that brush effect. Um, and you can see at the top and bottom here, I've got sort of like light and shadow, and that's applying this sort of faux lighting to the paint as well to try and give it some depth. So you can actually see some sort of reflection on the top parts of that paint, yeah. try and give it, you know, lift it off the page just a little bit. Um, but yeah, when I first, I kind of had this thought, I was like, I bet that would work if I could, you know, create a palette and like sample that onto this bigger canvas, at like a brush head. I bet that would look really good. And then um, had like a kind of proof of concept. And I was like, dang, yeah, that effect looks really great. And I think I tweeted that at some point. It must have been several months ago now. But yeah, it was like, that was really the light bulb moment. I was like, dang, okay, that's cool. This, this is going to work. Um, there was quite a lot of time spent refining this kind of brush head though. So originally started with like a bunch of sort of little bristles, like little dots. 
uh, eventually kind of moved more towards this just the straight rectangle and that rectangle kind of um, feathers and adjusts differently depending on the scenario. So you might notice sometimes here it kind of breaks on corners and things because um, you know if, if you just kind of always have it rotate perfectly with whatever direction the part's going, it just it kind of breaks down this effect of it actually being raw and organic and applied by hand because it's just perfectly precise, right? Um, so quite a lot of refinement went into sort of just breaking things up to make them feel a bit more organic. Um, I think these little ones are a great showcase of sort of how that brush texture can can work out. When you just add like a bit of rotation, right, you get quite a lot more of this, mm -hmm. this effect of an actual sort of stroke where you've twisted the brush and you're getting like different thicknesses of paint at the tips and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, it's... <laughs> Honestly, I think about 80% of this project was like refining that proof of concept after I'd figured it out. It was, it was like, cool, the effect works. Now I've got to actually make it look good and uh, handle all those edge cases that kind of break down the effect a bit, you know? So, yeah. yeah. I'm curious <laughs> to know, how do you, so for this type of project, obviously there's so much time and detail that kind of went into it. Like, how do you know when this project is, you know, complete, when it's ready to, to launch? Is there like a defining <laughs> moment or is it more of just like, you know what I've done as much as I can do. I'm happy with it. And let's just see what happens. Yeah. It's an interesting one. I think a lot of generative artists kind of struggle with this because there's always so much more you can do. Maybe artists just more generally. Um, I guess when you hit that point where any further addition kind of potentially just starts subtracting from the overall whole, you know, mm -hmm. that's, that's a good kind of sign, I guess. I think also maybe just your general feel towards it is probably a good barometer, right? It's like, I think this is looking really good. You know, I'm happy. I, I addressed all these little things that I had in the back of my mind that I wasn't happy with. Um, there probably is more I could do with it, you know, but at this point, I think it's it's saying what I want it to say. Um, and I think it's time to put it to bed, you know? <laughs> it's yeah. like, the other thing too is, is that there's only a fine out amount of time you've got to explore all these ideas you might have. And you, know, you can't just... Um, continue on the same path forever. You got to kind of continue on and keep growing and evolving and working on new things. And uh, so, I mean, I'm really happy with how this turned out. I think it's, it's better now than what I had initially envisioned even, which is, which is awesome. And that's a, an amazing thing to be able to say. I think at some point in the future, I might come back to the whole paint simulation thing and try and dig even deeper. So instead of having this sort of blending through like a really um, organic palette, uh, instead, maybe actually try and simulate things a bit more heavily. So actually, like bringing some of that wet media stuff in, some of those um, actual sort of physical processes that happen with real paint, and try and create something that's a bit more of a true simulation rather than sort of like an analog. Um, yeah, I think that'd be really interesting. But I think that's on the back of of the heap of current <laughs> ideas I need to explore. So yeah, <laughs> like absolutely. Years before I get to that. Well, I think yeah. kind of the beauty with this project for me is just like how it's being rendered live. You know, you're seeing those brush strokes kind of like paint over that canvas. How did you land on, you know, the speed of the actual rendering? Because I'm sure that's just got to be, you, you don't want it to obviously go too fast. It's almost like, I feel like the speed you chose was perfect because it's almost a, you know, kind of like a meditative feel to it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um so there is a couple of aspects to this. I, I, I like the the effect itself fundamentally kind of needs to happen over time because it's all about this. You kind of um, you're taking a texture and then like applying that brush head to it every step of the way along the path. And so, you know, each of the even each of these little dapples will probably have, you know, a hundred points or more, um, you know, along this little path that you can see here. And it's it's that kind of really slow kind of stepping that creates this really fluid effect of the paint because otherwise you kind of see these you know jagged rectangles moving across the screen um and so that was kind of like a factor we're originally just building it out as kind of it had the speed inherent to how the effect works so i'd kind of set it up with a certain number of points per path and i'd run it at like 60 frames a second and this is how fast them to go right um but then obviously that was probably that was quite slow i mean if i if i try and show that again this is what it'd be like at one time speed so let me just bring there we go so bring it right down to one time speeds. So this is at like 60 frames a second. It's actually just stepping across this path. So mm. this must be about 180 steps or something like that. If it takes a few seconds to get from end to end. Um, this is obviously a bit too slow, right? This is this doesn't feel analogous <laughs> to a painter's hand. It's a bit like yeah. this is a bit too precise and a bit too 
Um, so then what I, what I ended up doing is actually just kind of multiplying that speed. Um, and it is just literally running that process like more than once per, per frame, essentially, to, in order to speed it up. Um, and so that then actually increases the processing power required to do it. So on this, this MacBook of mine, I can step it up quite far, even at this high res. This is sort of like three by 4,000 pixels or something. Um, I could get it to run at sort of this four to five times speed, which is sort of the, the speed which I think works best um, visually. I, I do like that meditative feel of it because, you know, it does make it feel a lot more sort of intentional. And it really, it really brings focus onto the fact that these are like simple forms. Um, it's a machine, you know, applying them, which is kind of the unusual part of this process. If it was a human hand, right, you could expect maybe more just kind of like flourishing and, and really quick work. But I think seeing it painted out in this really slow and intentional way um, kind of brings a lot of focus onto the fact that it's, it's all being done in a digital space. Uh, if I bring the resolution of this down a bit, like if I go bring it right down, then, then all of a sudden like the machine's a lot more capable of, or the GPU is a lot more capable of doing it faster. So, you know, you can, you can even, there's a little, uh, there's a little method here you can use to set it to whatever speed you want. So you run that 20 times. So then it's, it's quite a lot faster. Yeah. Um, that's cool. But you know, even this, to me, this is starting to break down the effect now. Like it's just a bit too far. It feels more mechanical because it is just like, a, it's too uniform. Right. I think um, having it a bit more methodical, I think it is where that speed is, is in the sweet spot. So yeah, about that sort of that production level speed is kind of the, the ideal speed in my mind. Yeah, um, absolutely. And that does, it does step down if, if your device is kind of struggling with it. So it'll start out at this like primary speed of sort of four or five times. And then if your device is struggling, it actually steps it down. <clears throat> and that's just to like make it compatible with slower machines and, and mobile devices and stuff like that too. Because I wanted, I really wanted the live view to be, you know, front and center with this. To me, the live view is really the critical, you know, the critical form of these, these works. Actually seeing it paint in front of you is, is the powerful part. I mean, I really love the final outputs as well. Um, but like actually seeing that active painting in this digital space is kind of where the, the power lies with this concept. And so, yeah, it was important to me that, you know, even if you're viewing it on a mobile, you kind of, you get to see that, that performance acted out in front of you. Yeah. yeah. I love that. I think it's, it, it's totally necessary. I think without it, it would just lose so much of the, the beauty in, in this project. So I'm mm -hmm. really glad that you added that element to it. Um, so I think yeah. a lot of people, I didn't know about this until just recently, but there's an interactive element to the project. Do you mind uh, touching base yeah, on this that's part? Right. Yeah, for sure. So as I was working on the paint, you know, I needed a way of like creating paths that um, could cover like a bunch of the sort of future um, automated kind of paths that I was planning to use. So I wanted to do things like these squiggles and like, you know, um, quick back and forth zigzags and, and different sorts of paths and circular forms and things like that. And so instead of going through and programming all those in from the very beginning, because in my mind, that was kind of like the second piece of the project. The first piece was getting this paint looking, um, looking the way I wanted it, and then moving on to how the forms come together. Um, so I created this, this way of actually painting paths onto the canvas. And that way, like it'll, it'll paint it out and actually, <clears throat> it allowed me to test it, right? Because then I could, I could just draw out a bunch of, so I'm just going to clear that canvas quickly. I'm not sure if anyone knows this, but you can actually clear the, clear the paths off the canvas too by hitting backspace. If I do a bunch, and you can backspace oh, them. Wow. You can you can del delete them all if you go shift. So if I do like a fresh one, and do like a shift backspace, it'll actually remove all the current paths, and you can start with a fresh slate. Um, so yeah, you know, I, I built this tool just so I could test out the paint and see how it was looking, including this sort of like debug overlay, which included like the paths on. This is a very like developer thing to do, right? Your, your debug <laughs> tools are. Are your baby, right? Where you're just like, this is the most fun part is actually building in these little, these little ergonomic tools that make working with it easier. Um, and so after I'd kind of, I'd finished kind of wrapping up the actual automated forms and stuff too, I was like, oh, that painting thing is really fun though. Uh, I think people would get a kick out of that. So I just decided to leave it in as an Easter egg. Um, and so yeah, it's activated by double clicking on the on a token, and then you can then it brings up the path overlay and stuff too. You can hit the, uh, the the front slash key, and that brings up the overlay full time. So then you can actually paint without it disappearing every time you let go of the mouse. Um, oh, that's super cool. That's and so yeah, awesome. just it's it's lots of fun. It's it's like a couple of people mentioned to me as well. They were just like, I don't know if it, it's it's taking away potentially from the 
the final pieces, I was like, yeah, I know, but it's just, it's too much fun to like, to not include it. So yeah. um, I wanted to not everyone sure will know about it, it. Even if it's a bit of an Easter egg. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Absolutely. That's right. Well, I heard some you know, funny there... tweets where people are like, um, sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. Go ahead. You can finish this thing. Oh, I've heard, I've heard some, I've heard some funny tweets where people are kind of like, uh, they've mentioned like, oh, you can double click and it shows the path. That's really cool. I'm like, oh, you should try moving your mouse after you've done that. <laughs> and then, um, then they realize they can paint on it too, which is pretty hard. Case. That's so awesome. Oh, you, you have a couple of the tokens, which are perpetual. You know how many perpetual tokens there are in this project? And yeah, so we ended up getting eight of them. I, I think I said it at about 2%. Uh, got one here that I've just had running for the last hour or so. So it's pretty much filled the whole canvas now. Um, so yeah, I think eight of them came out, which is cool because like they're very much a, a unique <laughs> type of form in this. Um, this is really chaotic, you know, like the it's using um, sort of a system of splines that kind of branch off from each other to kind of create this never ending sort of painted piece. And some of them, you know, do these kind of quite nice long strokes like this and then some of them will dart around really quickly and stuff like that um but it, when i've created this i really had it in mind as like a struct uh, sorry a sculptural sort of output where i could put this on a screen and have it running potentially for days or weeks or months even uh without being reset the idea being it just kind of keeps painting over itself and that really leans into the the sort of the theme around automation and like the fact that it's machine painting this you know um, the machine doesn't get tired. The brush it's using never runs out of paint. Um, you know, the paint is infinite. So it's kind of like, it's it kind of like a nice way of flexing against the the truly generative aspect of this and the digital aspect of this and how that actually kind of extends out beyond what's possible in the physical world. Um, even the standard forms kind of do that to some degree. You know, you can never get paint that's that thick across an entire brush stroke. It's kind of... Um, surreal in that way but you know these ones are just like <laughs> over the top where it's just let's let this run and it'll paint forever um so yeah, yeah i'm hopeful that at some point i'm gonna be able to exhibit one of these i'll have it running on the screen and leave it up there for a couple of weeks and, and yeah. ideally yeah if there's no power cuts or anything it'll keep running the whole time and then um it'd be great to maybe take some snapshots along the way too so i can see kind of how it's changed because obviously, like I through testing, I, I, I've only left this running maybe overnight and then checked in to see if it's still going. <laughs> but you know, the idea of actually leaving it running for a few weeks would be would be really interesting. I love that. That's super yeah. cool. I, yeah, I would love to. So, would that be part of an exhibit that you're thinking about, or is this more of just yeah, ideas? yeah? I'm hoping to do an exhibit. Yeah, hoping to do an exhibit. I've been just um, kind of reaching out to a couple of galleries here in Auckland to try and set something up. There's a great one in my area here in Tetarangi who do really cool contemporary art. Um, they do some cool digital stuff up there. Um, this is actually there's quite an artistic area that I live in. It's really really inspiring in that way as well, actually. Um, cool. So yeah, I'd love to do something locally, just because you know this is my place and I love it here, and that'd feel like a big achievement to be able to kind of present this work of mine to to my community as well. Um, beyond that, you know, I've I've had a couple of inquiries too for for other places globally, which I'd really love to be able to exhibit this at. Um, I think the perpetual ones are definitely the more sculptural of them. Although I've had thoughts too about maybe just having a series of tokens or even completely randomized tokens, which it'll like, kind of like paint it out and have a pause and then it can kind of start fresh with a new painting. So it's kind of just running through things in series. I think that'd be really interesting too. Um, and then, you know, even in, in printed form, I've got a couple of these at really high res. You know, obviously I did Mint Zero before the actual drop. That's at 30 by 40, which looks awesome. I've got another massive one. Um, that I'm getting printed at 36 by 48, which is enormous, probably the biggest piece of work I've done. That's also gonna be on canvas. And that's, it's really interesting doing it on canvas because obviously like with such a painterly effect, seeing it on a canvas really like drives home the effect, right? Cause if you see it printed in, in behind glass, it, it almost, it doesn't quite suit the visual effect because you know, if it's paint, it's kind of analogous to being on a canvas and stretched and maybe in a tray frame or something versus sort of being behind glass. and on paper you know so <laughs> i've tried to lean into that a bit so yeah i want to i want to get a couple of these like nice big canvas prints done too and then ideally exhibit that alongside the physical as i heard the digital so you can see it running on a screen in real time um maybe even a screen where it's interactive if i had a touch screen or something and then also like a nice high quality print um so you can kind of see all three of those steps and the fact that it can extend from this real-time digital version into this fully high resolution printed version as well cool i love yeah. that 
Well, let's talk a little bit about the color. I'm curious to know kind of how you went about selecting colors for, you know, these, these brush strokes and like, did they have any meaning to, or inspiration or influence from, you know, your personal life or how do how do you come about doing that? Yeah, for sure. Um, so the way that this system, and it's kind of a similar system to terroir, right? Where it's kind of got like a base color and then it'll, it'll kind of warp around that base color in order to uh, reach different sort of parts of, of the palette. So if I bring up some examples here, maybe. Um, so for example, like this is sort of like a red base and then you can see it kind of moves all the way through that range of sort of slightly warmer, slightly cooler, darker and lighter around that base to kind of give it that, that depth and richness of color. Um, and so that's kind of, that's how the color system works. It's very procedural in that way. It kind of, it always, it's always calculated based on that random seed, which is, which is quite fun. And again, coming back to like the problem of control though, you know, like I can, <laughs> I can refine things as much as possible, but it's still just impossible to, impossible to predict how it's going to come out in the end. Um, and that's quite daunting for a long form project. Cause like, obviously there's no curation. It's, it's, the system's got to work and, and put out like nice quality outputs all the time, ideally. Um, I'm happy with, with, you know, how the color and stuff turned out in these though. It's great. There's definitely like a red bias to the system. I really love these sort of warm earthy tones. You get sort of more of the yellows and the browns and the reds and the oranges. Um, Cause to me, those feel really vibrant and like the warmth that's there is really, I, I guess it really amplifies like the richness of the color and the texture when you see those kind of warmer tones. Um, Cause if we have some that are a bit more blue, like also gorgeous, love this as well. But I think the blue is just a bit more, um, it feels a bit less organic to me. It's a bit more alien, right? Um, so I think like leaning into those warmer tones has often been my preference with this sort of work. Um, and then there are a few um, kind of special colorways as well. So there's this kind of desaturated colorway. And I really love this. There's about 18% chance of these black and white ones coming up. As I was building it, you know, I had these black and white ones in mind, especially like a black stroke on a white canvas is just, you know, the height of minimalism. <laughs> just really bold contrast and stuff. Um, and I just really loved the way they looked. I really also really loved when I had kind of like a white paint on top of a white canvas. That was really nice, really nice sort of minimal aesthetic uh, where it's all about the texture. You know, it's like a study of texture rather than necessarily being all about color. And similarly, even some of the black on black ones are really interesting, super dark and brooding and emotional. Um, so yeah, th this was kind of like, some of these black and white ones are, are my favorites, to be honest, throughout the whole series. And then um, there's also the kind of the royal colorway, which kind of blows out the, the blue channel quite a lot. Um, so it's still procedural, but it takes kind of the top end of the of the blue range and really amplifies it. So if, if, if the, the, you know, the dice roll comes out as the blue channel being, you know, close to 100% or whatever, like between sort of like 95 and hundred percent, it really amplifies that blue effect so that you get this much more sort of blue purple um, range of colors. And, and I think like, it's just really interesting seeing such bright blue, you know, there's a lot of kind of art history there about blue pigments being really valuable and difficult to find and things like that. And, um, you know, especially in like, I think it was like in the eighties or whatever, where they, they kind of established this new form of blue, like Klein blue or whatever, which is kind of, it was like a game changer as far as how bright of a blue you could have in paint. Um, so it's just kind of interesting seeing, seeing these sort of super bright in your face blue outputs as well. Um, but I wanted them to be quite rare. So it's, they're definitely sort of the most restrained <laughs> as far as chances go, yeah. That's great, that's awesome. Well, let's talk a little bit about, you know, these different features that are a part of this project. I know you have a couple of examples that you're gonna share as well. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I might just run through these these examples as well. Yeah, but, oh, please do. I might run it, I'll run it live, let's do it live. Great. So um, this is this is called the Dapple style one. And this has a, this has a couple of different um, arrangements. It can just have like random, random dapples like we saw on this one just over here. So this is still a dapple, but it's, it's not kind of structured into that radial uh, composition. So these are just randomized. They're kind of placed using pass on disk. So you get this kind of nice uniform distribution of them across the canvas. They don't overlap or anything like that. Um, and then this is an example where they do overlap slightly by bringing that density in. And they're also all just kind of pointing towards the center of the canvas. And that gives you that interesting effect of sort of like a, a burst of paint strokes kind of coming up from the center. These ones take quite a while to paint too. So it's kind of fun to watch them because they're just lots of little 
lots of little bits. Um, then I've got these jazzy ones. So, you know, after I cre created the paint, I was kind of thinking about all the different forms I wanted to do. I definitely knew I wanted to do these kind of like straight lines with a bit of a wiggle in them. I wanted to do like little dapples and things like that, but I wanted something that was a bit more expressive as well. You know, a lot of these so sort of like abex action painting style pieces are much more um, raw and, you know, like a lot more expressive with the actual form of the brush stroke. Um, so I wanted to try and explore something like that too. So I kind of came up with these, these spline driven ones, which use um, yeah, these cardinal splines and different tension levels to kind of create these big swooping forms and things like that. And I really love these. I felt like as soon as I started seeing them, I was like, this feels kind of like a, for some reason it just, it just resonated as like jazz improv in my brain. So that's, that's where the kind of the jazz theme came from, I guess, both for those forms and then kind of I rolled that out across the other forms as well, but um, with pitter patter and stuff like that. But um, yeah, the jazzy forms are some of my favorites just because they're, they're, they're still super minimal, but they're just, they're really flowy and really, um, really satisfying. I've got, I've got these kind of simple line based ones. Um, and these have like a bit of noise thrown in to try and create, you know, a bit more of a human touch as far as how the paint's actually applied. You have to be a very precise painter to get like a perfectly straight, <laughs> unless you've got like a roller or something. Um, so that was kind of, and it, and it adds to the, the thickness of the material too, right? To see kind of almost this globby stroke adds to the fact that there's weight to this and it, it's viscous and it's got, you know, a bit, of, a bit of presence compared to just being like a perfectly straight line. So quite a lot of time was spent just trying to like move away from precision in this and actually make it feel a bit more, a bit more random and a bit more loose um, to make it feel a bit more human, you know? It's awesome. Uh, it's another jersey one. With the jersey ones, they can be inside or outside the frame. So there's all sorts of like different parameters inside each form too. You know, they can extend outside the frame. They can be within this one. You know, has a different number of strokes for these pillars, for example. Um, here's one which is the ranges, which basically just extends across the entire canvas. I'm not sure if you can hear that in the background. It's my, uh, <laughs> my son crying <laughs> yeah. down there, but it's all right. <laughs> um, it's real life, man. It's improv um, right there. <laughs> so, the, yeah, yeah. So these are quite rare. I, I mean, I really like these. I think that like they seem to resonate really well with the audience too, which is which is cool. But these, I called these ranges because to me they they give me a real sort of landscape vibe. You get these rolling hills, this effect of rolling hills and distance and depth, and it's amazing. Like it's the same, you know, the same effect, but applied in a different form can create a much different um, sort of presence and and perspective. Uh, these ones are called pictures originally called the marches because to me these just feel like like some sort of abstract like marching movements almost like swinging arms and legs and things like yeah. that and i really found that really awesome when i first kind of stumbled upon this i was like oh that's that's so cool um the marches yeah and so these ones are just like quite simple horizontal strokes quite short but they really curl at the edges and that's what gives it that sort of effect so with the way that the brush head rotates with the path as well as the paint palette rotating with the path um, you really get a lot of that sort of, um, oops, let me reset this. You get quite a lot of that, that movement of the paint and, you know, that, that kind of viscous mm -hmm. nature of it, which I really love. What else we got? We've got, um, these ones are called patterns, which are just really nice straight lines. So this is like, this is kind of like my minimal viable product as far as getting the actual automated forms going. So I had this kind of, these just rows of simple straight dapples. And I was like, cool, this, like, this is a great way of both testing the paint, but also showing how compelling, you know, the effect can be that I can get this, this richness of color and texture with what is essentially just like super simple rows of strokes. And like, you know, while that's definitely not in line with Abex, that's much more like minimalist <laughs> style painting. I wanted to keep that in because I think it really highlights the tension between sort of like a machine's precision and like being able to, you know, perfectly align things. And then sort of that more human gestural, you know, flourishy sort of stroke. Um, and these range from sort of quite quite structured and quite straight to quite out there and all over the place. Um, let's see if I can find an example. Oh, here's one. So here, same thing, right? So it's still a pattern, but this is like really broken outside of the grid at this point. And it creates these much more abstract sort of um, compositions where it is still just a bunch of <clears throat> vertical strokes, but in a much more, um, I guess, evocative form. And what I really like about these is they actually kind of lend quite a lot of three-dimensionality to it. So you kind of, once it's finished painting, you get quite a lot of a three-dimensional feel out of these. It feels 
like this stuff in the background and the foreground. And it's amazing how just breaking it out of the grid can create, you know, that sort of depth effect. Um, just trying to think there's one of those chairs. There's obviously the, there's the perpetual ones, which we talked about. Mm -hmm. um, no, not that one. Well, yeah, I, so these I don't ones, know if there's... Yeah, go ahead. These ones are, this is like this this system which paints forever, but I also use these in, in what's called like the improvised form, um, which is just kind of like a more finite version of this, where it takes the same kind of approach of branching off from the previous path to create a new one. Um, but then it applies it. Um, I don't think I have an example of that up here, but I'll see if I can find one quickly. <laughs> okay, yeah, no problem. Just doing it live. This was also a really useful tool to be able to like visualize the paths as I was developing. Right? Yeah, so I, I was going to say, of... that's a great way oh, to do it. Oh, that's a perpetual. Oh, man, that's a beautiful perpetual one. Look at that oh. blue. Um, might not be able to find one. But um, those were like a lot more abstract because that, that really is leaving quite a lot of it up to chance where it's like, instead of having like a start position, a stop position, it really is just leaving it up to sort of the branching algorithm to to make for a, an interesting composition. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to get one. Quite low probability. There's one. So you can see here the paths. They're, they're already predefined, but um, so it kind of spits out a bunch of these different branched splines um, off of each path, and then that'll paint it out. And some of them are, are quite abstract, as if you look through the ones that have come out as this form, but some of them are quite cool too. You get like almost um, sort of like stick figurine style shapes or you know things mm -hmm. that really look like they're in motion because there's just there's something inherently recognizable to seeing a form, you know, in something like this. We're like, oh, that looks like a person's arms, or that looks like, you know, something in action. Um, that's quite fun too. It's a bit less well defined than you know, just like dapples or lines, or it's 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 kind of much more up to the machine to to try and create something interesting or the randomness, I, I suppose I should say. Um, yeah. Well, I noticed also. I think it was on the website, or maybe on the somewhere in the the channel where you mentioned that there's like a a 36, I know you kind of talked about, hinted on it like earlier on about a 36 by 48 print option. Is that something where, you know, people that hold the token, are they able to to order a print using that? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So if you hold a token, um, I allow you to order a print. Um, you've got to come, you can just message me directly to, to get it started. So I need to export them myself because I, I kind of stick the algorithm into like print mode, which then scales everything up to like a really high res and it's really slow. You know, it'll take upwards of half an hour to render some of them just because it's uh, you know, yeah. rendering it at like 16,000 <laughs> by something. <laughs> um, and like even that little paint swatch at the bottom right, that goes from sort of 512 pixels up to sort of like 4096, you know, so it's super high res. Um, and so you can imagine if that's doing that, 60 frames a second, it's that's a lot of rendering. So the fan on my MacBook on fire when that's happening. Um, but yeah, so 36 by 48 is kind of the max I could do for this series. Uh, unfortunately, unlike Tewa, since this kind of paints over time and actually it kind of applies to this this buffer texture, so it keeps like ping ponging between the previously painted frame and the next frame you're painting, I can't quite like extend that up to that full on, you know, maximum, maximal, can't even open it in Photoshop size, but, you know, 36 by 48 is still lovely and, and big. Um, it looks great printed. You can actually see when you look up close at that size, I've actually got one here, I can quickly zoom in on. Uh, when you look up close at that size, you can really start to see some of the the details of the effect and how that um, kind of reveals itself, which I think is quite fun. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, let me just give this up. Here we go. So here's Mint Zero. Um, and this is something I can do too. If someone is interested in the canvas print, the way that I've done Mint Zero, I can um, kind of stick the algorithm into this specific mode, which essentially just adds this extra space around the sides. And that allows, you know, allows room for stretching of the composition around the frame. So, you know, you might have a <clears throat> you might have a composition which runs sort of top to bottom, like this, top to bottom. Um, and essentially, if this is printed, that's fine because you know it can crop to the paper. But if it's on a canvas, I actually need to kind of create additional space above and below so that it can be stretched around, you know, the canvas frame. Um, so I can I can offer that as well. And then if you zoom in on this, you know, you get these these really awesome. Awesome details. And if you go right in and if you stand right in front of it and look up really close, you can see like quite a lot more of how the background texture is working. Got this kind of recycled paper thing. Um, you can even see this kind of chattering of where the brush head's kind of moving, moving through. Um, 
And that's really interesting. It kind of bugged me at first, but now that I've, I've seen it in print, I actually love that it's there because it really showcases the effect and sort of the digital nature of this while still, if you take a step back, you get this much more, you know, smooth and fluid uh, version of it. So it's, it's quite interesting to be able to kind of get up close and inspect that detail as well. Yeah, you really nailed it with all the details. So I'm excited to kind of see collectors, you know, <laughs> get these prints made or for you to have an exhibit and to kind of just have these out in the world. I think that's that's super cool. Yeah, for sure. Well, maybe we, I know we're getting there on time, but maybe you could spend a couple moments yeah. kind of just talking about some of your favorite mints or maybe some mints that kind of surprised you. Yeah, yeah, totally, man. Totally. Um, this one here I really love. This has just got like to me a really organic feeling, you know, structure to the way that this pardon me this wiggle kind of works it just really feels like it's done by a human hand to, to my eyes um <clears throat> and a good friend of mine rich paul he's also based in new zealand he's a generative artist he's he's purchased this and so i'm getting a big 36 by 48 canvas print of this one done as well for him um i thought this one was really interesting there's like a real sense of depth with this because it starts out dark at the bottom here kind of gets lighter and lighter almost like it's emerging from sort of like a, a dark space and that's purely incidental, just how the palette kind of ended up randomizing. But I think that effect is, is quite emergent, quite interesting. It's kind of similar on this one here. Um, this one I really love. Um, it's got really, this is quite broad as far as like, this is a jazzy one, but the the path really like swings back and forth across the entire canvas. And that's quite unusual. Um, and so this, this feels really interesting and unique to me because it's got these really, yeah, these really wide strokes and feels very, very fluid and natural as well, but also it's kind of cropped in to the point where, you know, you'd be running off the canvas if you're painting in this way, but the fact that it has kind of achieved that is really interesting. I love these really minimal compositions. You know, I think I highlighted this on Twitter in a thread I just did recently, like the height of minimalism. Love the fact that it steps from this really dark kind of charcoal -y black through to sort of a lighter color. And that's also by chance, you know, so it's the, the texture and the color of that palette actually changing in a really um, incidental and um, pleasing way over the course of painting the four strokes. Similar with this one. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I really like this. <laughs> this one's just really unusual because it's just so simple, right? Just like a little squiggle down the page. Showcases how, you know, on these sharp turns, it breaks at the corners, which kind of gives it the effect of actually painting individual strokes down, you know, the page rather than just being one fluid stroke. Um, this one here and this one below it, in my eyes, are just gorgeous black and white outputs. I'd really love for these two to be to be exhibited side by yeah, side at some point in absolutely. time because they're they're perfect, both the form and the like the opposite contrast and just oh they're gorgeous of them. This one's really unique. I see kind of like weird visceral sort of, you know, <laughs> guts kind of things, but also like <laughs> a bunch of grapes. There's all sorts of weird things you can see in this, like a chili pepper. I don't know, it's it's bizarre. Yeah, it's it. kind of a very it's a very strange form that one. Um, this one's just like electric with the blueness, which I really like. Um, this one I really love. It's just like a really nice dark on dark. It's quite imposing, but it's it's uh, yeah, it's it's just bold, really bold. Uh, I love this one as far as just the contrast and the texture. I think this one's just really well balanced. I think this would look really really awesome in print. So whoever owns this one, you should hit me up. We'll make it happen. <laughs> um, this one I ended up purchasing for myself. I wanted like a memento. So I bought this one on secondary as, as things were going up. This was just a complete surprise to me, you know, because I'd made this sort of this um, center aligned dapple quite a rare outcome. And um, just this, the range of colors in this from the blacks to the blues, to the yellows, to the pinks, it just really blew me away. As soon as I saw this, I was just like, oh my gosh. I, I mean, there's no way I could have programmed that in, you know, that's just purely, um, purely like down to luck and, and I love it. So I purchased that one to, to have printed myself. This, this is one I'm getting done at 36 by 48. I just love that one so much. Um, this one I really love. It's got this kind of really muted, um, almost like a bouquet of flowers, you know, like hydrangeas and things like that. So I really love that kind of, whoops, that muted color effect on this as well as the really interesting kind of jazzy forms as well. <clears throat> This one's a great example of one with a bit of depth. So like this is what I was saying about, you know, when you've got this breaking outside the grid, this really creates a, a 3D effect. We've got stuff in the foreground, in the background, and it's really got a, a three-dimensional and three-dimensionality to it. Um, and here's just another one of these, which I just thought was really gorgeous. This one's inside the frames, you know, so it's all contained within the within the canvas, which is also just really interesting. Kind of like a, it feels very intentional when it's contained. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
I like how there's kind of like yeah, a little bit of a border pockets. around that piece also on the sides, especially. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, for cool. sure. Well, I appreciate well, I, you. I love lots of them. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, I know we could definitely talk for hours. I'd love to kind of dissect <laughs> and talk sure. about each mint, but it's been, sure. you know, fantastic to kind of see you talk about, you know, active emotion and go through some of these mints. So I really appreciate you sharing that, Kelly. Yeah, thanks, um, mate. It's been really great to Yeah. Share. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I just had, you know, two more questions before we wrap things up. Mm -hmm. You know, I always find that, uh, I mean, even just outside of the space, mental health, I feel like is incredibly important. So I always like to highlight it during these conversations. And so I'm kind of curious, you know, for yourself, like, how do you wind down once a project is fully minted out? Or maybe even during the process, like, what do you, like, what do you do for yourself to kind of, uh, I don't know, get away from the space or kind of just focus on yeah. uh, your mental health? Yeah, yeah, definitely super important. Uh, I think the space can be, you know, it moves so fast and it can be so intense and um, so much to try and keep on top of with all the discords and everything. I think, yeah, just disconnecting a bit is probably something that I've, I've found really helps. You know, I've for a long time, I've been quite sort of um, disconnected from social media because I kind of identified, you know, with Facebook and things. I was just finding those things weren't serving me. So several years ago, I kind of just shut down all my other social medias except for Twitter, and that's all I use now. Um, and like, yeah, when it's all getting too much, like, <laughs> you know, in the lead up to this drop, you know, it was just so intense trying to properly market the thing and, and engage with everyone and trying to like do my best at, at doing the series justice. You know, it's just, it's, it's so much, um, mental energy and emotional energy. Um, it was really draining. So over the last couple of weeks, I've really just kind of stepped back a bit, tried to just disconnect a bit while still obviously being there for engagement and stuff. I want to make sure that. You know, I'm there to answer any questions or anything like that, but just taking a step back, spending less time on my computer. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah I do like a lot of cooking and barbecuing and um, I brew my own beer. And so doing these like wow. analog things that aren't digital, um, I find really help because it just kind of brings you back into the real world a bit where you're like, you've got these, these processes, which are just a bit more meditative and a bit more, um, they require the same skills, you know, like attention to detail and, and process and stuff. But just in a much slower pace and, and with these more natural processes and stuff. And I find that actually really grounds me and that's really fun. Um, Very cool. But yeah, food and, and eating is massive for me. It's <laughs> like a huge passion of mine. Yeah. I love that. Well, I appreciate you sharing that. Yeah. And, and finally, you know, how can people reach you? Should they have any questions, um, any social media plugs you want to mention? Yeah. I mean, catch me on Twitter for sure. That's kind of where I, I share stuff. Not so much at the moment because I'm, I'm busy kind of wrapping this all up, but um I share whips and stuff on there and, and you know, I kind of engage with other artists and stuff on there. Um, I have my website, which you can go visit. That's just got kind of like my, my body of finished work as it were. Um, so if something's, you know, good enough to, to try and advertise over the years, I'll put it up there um, just as like a sort of a, you know, a flag. <laughs> um, but yeah, otherwise, I, you know, as I just was saying, I guess I try and disconnect from most other things. So I'm not on Instagram or anything, but yeah, come find me on Twitter. Okay. Great. Well, we'll include all that information inside of the show notes. And, you know, Kelly, again, thank you so much for talking to us about, you know, your career to drop on Artblocks and just telling us a little bit about your background. It's just always, it's just been a, a fantastic time chatting with you today. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks so much, man. It's been great. Absolutely. Well, we got a couple of show notes. Uh, after Dinner Mint's discussions are available as a podcast. You can check these conversations out weekly via Spotify, Apple, Google, and Amazon. Finally, we have a weekly newsletter that gets delivered once a week with information on upcoming drops and generative art-related news. You can find a link to the newsletter in the description of this YouTube video. Thank you again to Kelly Milligan for joining me on After Dinner Mints. For anyone that's tuning in, make sure you comment, like, and subscribe to the Art Blogs YouTube channel. Be kind to each other, buy what you love, and we will see you all next week. Thanks again, Kelly. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you.